Hey everyone, welcome to Hustle is for Life Motivation. I'm your host, Salal, and I'm super excited to have you all join me today. I have a very special show for you as always. Let me ask you a question. Has there ever been a time in your life where you have had to take the role of a leader? Have you ever acted in the capacity of a leader in your life? What did that look like? Did that come naturally to you or was it hard? Did you have to take a step back and think about how am I going to do and what are people going to think about me? Or did you just step up and it was a very natural transition? Well, tonight's guest is absolutely phenomenal. His name is Jim Johnson. He is first of all a coach, but he's also a leader. He's a speaker. He's an author and he's got uh, his new book called A Coach, A Miracle. Um, and he's, he's got some really amazing insights into leadership and what does it take to succeed as a leader. He's been featured on Oprah. He's been featured on Good Morning America and ESPN. So with that, let me please welcome our guest tonight, Mr. Coach Jim Johnson. Mr. Coach Jim Johnson, Mr. Jim Johnson. Jim, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. Uh, I really appreciate you taking the time to be here. I know you're very busy, um, so I, I really do appreciate your time, sir. Um, but I, first of all, I want to say you have really accomplished a lot. Um, I love your message. You were actually featured in uh, the book by my good friend, Corey Poirier. Well, he's, he's our mutual connection, um, which is all about public speaking. So not only you are, are you a coach, not only are you uh, a leader, but you also are an author and a speaker. And that's absolutely phenomenal. But how, how did it all start? So we're going to go back in memory lane. And if you can help us just kind of understand how this journey actually start for you. Absolutely. Well, I'll just tell you very briefly, my childhood, I was the oldest of six children, and my dad was a teacher and a coach, and my mom was a teacher. So uh, I got into sports at a young age because my dad uh, was a coach of various sports and uh, fell in love with basketball in high school and actually played for my dad, uh, played on the team. I played for him for three years, and that was a very good experience. And then, uh, of course, I thought I was a better basketball player than I actually was. I went to college and thought I was going to go to the NBA. Then I didn't. I got cut from my college team, which was very humbling. But it was also a good lesson that I certainly wasn't as good as I thought I was. And uh, so I started, started a new journey. And my journey was, because basketball was still a great passion, was that I wanted to find a way to stay in the game of basketball. And I did that by being a teacher and a coach for over three decades. And uh, early in my career, I, uh, one of my dreams once I got out of college was to uh, become a varsity coach at a high school. And that dream came true to me at a, a young age of 25 years old, which is pretty young in my profession. And I, of course, thought I knew everything there was about coaching. And, and this team wasn't very good. But despite that, because of my great coaching acumen, I was going to lead them from the outhouse to the penthouse in a short period of time. Well, after leading that team to 17 consecutive losses, uh, and then I ended up leaving that job. Of course, I left that job because the uh, administration fired me. Uh, it really it was another humbling experience, but it ended up really doing a couple things for me. One, it made me realize that I had a lot to learn. And two, is it put a burn in my belly that I was going to uh, show people that I could be a successful coach because I, I still had great passion for coaching basketball. And I got a mentor the next year uh, at a, a college that helped me get back on my feet. But my real love is I wanted to be a varsity coach at a high school and ended up doing that for 29 more years at three different high schools and had uh, uh, some pretty good success uh, early in my career, but um, uh, after my early struggles, I should say, things started to get better. And then I had a really big blessing in my life. Back in 2003, I had a young man come into our program, and his name was Jason McElwain. Everybody calls him J-Mac. And J-Mac is on the autism spectrum, and he's also learning disabled. But that didn't stop him from having a big dream, and that was that he wanted to play in our basketball program. Well, he tried out for three straight years, never made the team, but ended up being our team manager three years, two years with me on the varsity. 
And because he was so loyal and committed, I decided to uh, give him an opportunity to play in our final home game. And I put him in uniform and put him in with just over four minutes to go. He missed his first two shots, including his first shot very badly. But then magic occurred. God looked over us. God smiled at us, whatever you'd like to say. And he actually made a three-pointer. I thought, it can't get any better than this. <laughs> he actually uh, started making shot after shot. And when the smoke had cleared, Jason had scored 20 points in less than four minutes, including wow. six three-pointers. And uh, after, I didn't think, uh, you know, I was real proud because I did it for the right reasons in my heart. I There was no media there, but... Um, uh, the word started to get around town, and uh, all of a sudden, media started to pick up on it. And within a week or so, we were on all the big TV stations, and uh, it just exploded into a global story. Uh, but backtracking just quickly, when I got fired from my first varsity position, one of the things that really hit me was that to be a better coach, I had to become a better leader. And that really started my leadership journey where I started to study leadership. And one of the things that I share with people, if you want to be successful, you should make it a study. And what I mean by that is try to learn as much about that subject or topic. And I became an excessive reader. I got involved with different groups um, to pick people's brains. I uh, tried to go to conferences and clinics. I listened to all, I, as I tell people, you should turn your car into a library on wheels. I would always listen to educational, inspirational. And my, my main things is I love learning about leadership, uh, success, motivation, those types of topics. And in fact, I've read well over a thousand books on those topics now. In between experimenting and learning, uh, I was able to, uh, with a really difficult start to my career, uh, turn it into highly successful. And then going back to the JMAC story, after that game, uh, I had been a fairly successful coach. We had a lot of winning records, but we had never won what we called our sectional championship. And that was my dream and Jason's dream to do that his senior year. And after that magical night, uh, three weeks later, our team ended up winning our first sectional championship. Wow. And I, uh, so I was putting these leadership keys that I'll share in a little bit. I, I talk about seven in my leadership presentation. Uh, and what I found was by putting these together, because I think there's two questions that I always hear in leadership. How do you get to the top in whatever you're leading? In my case, in sports, it was a title. Uh, in business, you know, there's uh, obviously profit and having success in the business. And whatever your de definition of top, how do you get there, which is a, is a challenging journey. And then the second question I'm often asked is, how do you stay there, which I think is even more difficult. And uh, I'll give you an example. It took me quite a while in my journey to get to the top, per se, in my profession. But then fortunately, because of these leadership techniques and teaching our players, uh, we went from winning one championship to my last 11 years, we actually won six. And so I share with these key principles that it helped us not only get to the top, but stay there for quite a while. Uh, so th those are some of the things I, I'd be glad to share with you. Uh, and the neat thing is Jason and I have stayed very close. In fact, Jason came back after that game a couple years later and actually volunteered in our program. Uh, for nine years, and we won a bunch of championships together as, as coaches as well. So that's a, kind of a little bit of background of the story and a little bit about me. Wow. Guys, make sure that you subscribe to the channel because guess what? The channel competition, I've decided I'm going to run every single month. So what that means is that if you go and hit that subscribe button down below and leave a comment anywhere on any video on the channel, doesn't matter what video it is, and I get a notification, you automatically get entered into the channel competition. And at the end of the month, well, the start of the next month, I will announce the winner and the winner will get free access to my new networking strategies course. These are the strategies that I have used to connect and build relationships with amazing people all over the world and bring them onto my YouTube channel to interview and to add value to That's uh, phenomenal. And uh, I have to say, when you were telling Jason's story, I, I was sitting here getting goosebumps. That is 
amazing. And I know you sh- you actually shared that uh, with the interview with uh, with Corey for 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 his new book, the book of public speaking. Um, yeah. and, and you said just how emotional that was for you to experience that firsthand to see Jason go right at the end of the game um, and 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 start scoring like a machine. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, just just quickly, if if we if we go back to that, um, you said you felt really proud, and I'm wondering what what was it about that moment when you saw Jason score that made you realize, wow, this 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 is something absolutely huge for for this person for Jason because he has struggled so much. Right. Well, you know, it, it, there were two things that I was really, really proud of. From an individual standpoint, it was Jason and the fact that he had worked so hard to try to make the team. Mm. And even though he did not, he never gave up. And so this was a way that I could give him something for all the, uh, the blood, sweat, and tears that he gave our program for three years. And to see him score a basket, and, you know, people uh, – didn't realize all the time and practice he put in just to have that one moment. Mm. And then of course to shine. And the other thing that was, I was extremely proud of, you know, in my book, A Coach and a Miracle, and I'm not going to delve into it because it's a long story, but we had a lot of strife, Jason's senior. And despite that, uh, because we were finally able to turn it around and get the team together, during that game when Jason entered, I never asked the other players on the floor to pass him the ball. But because mm-hmm. our team had become so cohesive, he actually was the only one that shot in those last four minutes, which really touched my heart and soul deeply to see. Because to me, that was the essence of teamwork, to, to help other people shine. And that's what his teammates were doing for Jason that night. Wow. Yeah, that's phenomenal. Um, but – Guys, in the audience, take a pause, okay? Because before Jim said something so powerful, I actually, I actually wrote it down, okay? And he said, if you want to be successful, make it a study, right? I actually wrote that down. That's a writer downer, okay? I hope you wrote that down because I did. That is phenomenal, amazing advice. And he talked about turning your car into a library on wheels, okay? So powerful. I totally agree because guess what? Every single day I listen to podcasts, I listen to audiobooks, I listen to lectures, I listen to talks on, on my way to work and back. Because as you know, my full-time job is a mass lecturer. So on my way to work and back, um, I always listen to this. Um, and it's like Brian Tracy says, you can get a university or college education just by listening to that stuff. And Jim said he's read about a thousand of these books on leadership, on success, on on, on how to actually make sure that you, you rebound from failure. It's, it's phenomenal. And this, this could be for you. This is something you can absolutely do. And even if you don't have a car, you might just take public transport. Hey, headphones, phone, iPod, come on, <laughs> let's do it. You can do it. That's all I'm saying, guys. Find a way you can do it. Um, Jim, this is a, a absolutely phenomenal. Your advice uh, is absolutely amazing. I hope people actually take action on it. Um, but let's go back to leadership. Okay. First of all, with leadership, do you, because there's, there's seems to be a conflicting view here among people. They say either you're a naturally born leader, either people say that, that you're naturally born a leader or other people, they say, no, you're not naturally born a leader. It's something that you become over time through experience. And from what I hear you said about your story, it's the fact that initially you experienced some adversity and failure in your career. And because of that, you became a great leader. So what's your opinion on this? My opinion is, is I believe leadership is a skill in skills you can learn. I think there are some people that are a little bit more naturally gifted, uh, but I really believe that the best leaders are people, as we mentioned before, that make it a study and are always striving to improve themselves uh, by feeding their mind, trial and error. As I, you know, I speak to a lot of groups, and I, I was just sharing with a group of college students the other day, and I said, 
uh, you're not, you know what, you need to learn from your mistakes, but you're not going to have enough time in your life to learn from all your mistakes. So you got to have mentors, people that have been through it before that can cut your learning curve down very much. And I think that that's huge key is that, uh, yes, you need to learn from your mistakes, and we're always going to continue to make mistakes, but the better leaders learn from them, keep growing, and you know, it really work on building a culture, which I can share some of my keys if you'd like, uh, that I found in my studies that helped me immensely as a leader, and now I share it with all types of audiences. Sure, absolutely. Uh, we, I love to hear those keys, and, and I'm sure it will add a lot of value to the audience as well. Okay, great. Well, I, the seven keys I talk about is the first one is clarifying your vision. And what I mean by that is, is the Bible says without vision, the people will perish. So you have to really have a clear objective of where you want to take your team, your organization, your business, whatever you're leading. And you do that in two ways. The first person you must lead, of course, is yourself. And so people to follow you, they have to be clear that, that you know what you want and you, uh, you're, you're someone that lives your core values. So the first thing I share with people is I think you should be clear about why you were put on this earth. And I, I talk about having a personal mission statement in writing. And I didn't have that early in my career. I was kind of bouncing all over the walls. And, and when I started to read and learn more about leadership, I knew that, that I had to be clear about my purpose. And my mission in life is to be an outstanding role model that makes a positive difference in the world by helping others make their dreams come true. Mm -hmm. And when I challenge your audience, if you don't have in writing, start thinking about what is most important to you, what I call your core values, and then try to put it into writing, and then, of course, trying to live it. The second part of uh, Claire and Your Vision is getting your team, your people involved on a group mission statement or a business mission statement or a team mission statement, whatever you like to call it. And you need input. But the other key is, is not just putting in writing and putting it up on a wall in your business or your organization. It's living it. And it starts with you leading and then uh, making sure that people are buying in on what the value. Because all the businesses, I talk to a lot of businesses now, that I've studied and read numerous books on, uh, you know what, they, they need to stay profitable to stay uh, in business, but they, you know what, their mission is not profitability. Their mission is something bigger and overarching that, and that creates profitability. So I think that's something I really learned. Second key I talk about is how do you build trust in your organization? or your team, because trust is essential to any successful team or organization. And I talk about three keys in that. One is that uh, you gotta do what you say and say what you do. Isn't it frustrating when you have a leader that tells you one thing and does something completely opposite? Mm. Number two is that I think you have to base your foundation on telling the truth. Again, he's quoting the Bible, the Bible says the truth will set you free. And then the third thing in building trust, I see I call building trust like building a bank account. If you continue to put deposits in, you're going to build that account. If you take withdrawals out all the time, you're going to deplete that account. With one caveat, though, is that uh, trust takes time to build, mm. but it can be smashed with one really poor judgment or decision. And so the last thing I talk about in building trust is as a leader, instead of always being the critiquer, I know that's part of your job, but change the mindset of trying to catch people doing the right thing and praise them specifically when they do. That will really build trust in your organization, which is essential to your success. The third thing I talk about is creating an edge. I think as a leader, we talked about that you're trying to always grow. Well, you need to grow your people. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. But find ways you create your edge. And I'll just share one. There's a lot of ways you can do that. Is I think you need to teach your people how to be effective goal setters. And I always talk to, uh, you know, working with, and I give them a couple goal setting activities. And I always tell them when you think it, ink it, which, of course, means to write it down. I always ask how many people have their goals written down. It's not many. And I, one of the exercises I'll share with your audience is I think you should find out what are your three most important goals. Write those on index cards and write out five cards. The first card you put, I am responsible. The second card you put, I like myself. The third card you put, your most important goal. Your fourth 
card, your second mold, and your fifth. And I want you to get in front of a mirror and start tomorrow and read those five in front of you. Now, you can add more goals, but start with three, uh, and it'll only take you a minute or two. And do that in the morning. Try to do it sometime during the middle of the day and do it right before you go to bed. Because I love quotes. I used to give my team a quote. One of my favorite goals quotes is, you can't hit a target you don't have. Mm. So, so that, you know, building clarity and, and certainly goal setting. And here's one key I found in leadership is not only do you got to have team or business goals, but you got to find out what individuals, their goals are and how they work to, with you on building those team or organizational goals. The fourth key I talk about is effective communication. And I'll just highlight one thing. Uh, you know, it's nice if you can be a good public speaker, but I found there's a lot of great leaders that aren't great public speakers, but what they are great at is they're great listeners. And uh, the old adage, you have two ears and one mouth, so you should listen twice as much as you speak. And that's the key, is you really got to find out and be open to ideas. And as I always told my players and my staff is, I always want to hear from you. I'm not always going to agree with you. I'm not always going to make changes on your, but I'm always willing to listen. And, and uh, after we talk about it, if I think it's the right thing, then we're going to make a change. So I think that's a real key. Fifth key is lead by example, which is kind of, uh, I always tell our players and is that you are always on stage. And the thing that I don't think people always realize, if you're a leader, People are always looking at you, and they want to see, are you consistent with what you say and what you do? And if you're not, that's going to lead to difficulty in your leadership. The sixth one I talk about is what I call leaving a profit. And in that, I talk about two things. One thing is, what is your leadership philosophy? See, our leadership philosophy, leaving a profit, means that everything that we touch, we want to get better not worse. And I give an illustration. When we used to take our teams to another school, I, I always would say, we want to leave the locker room that we change in better off than when we got there. So when, when talking about leading by example, when I'd walk in the locker room, if I'd see a piece of paper on the floor, what do you think I did? I picked it up because I want to leave things better than what I it was before. And we really try to engage that. And the second part is, as a leader, in understanding your leadership philosophy, do you have a personal growth plan? Uh, you know, we talked about that before with various ways you can feed your mind, but I think you should really have intentionally an idea how you're going to feed your mind every day and, and put a goal out there. Like my goal is I want to feed my mind a minimum of an hour a day. Okay. Mm. And, and so that, you know, just something to think about. Uh, are you trying to get better every day? People always talk about it, but are there actions showing that? And then my last key is what we call servant leadership, which has gotten very big. And the whole key on that is actually, I'll share two things. One is it's turning the pyramid around. The, pyramid, the old leadership pyramid is the person that's the leader on top and all the constituents are on the bottom. We'll flip that pyramid around. So now you're trying to serve people that you're leading. And two things about that is I think you should consistently ask your people, what can, what are you working on and how can I support you? And the second thing is, are you helping your people grow? You know, are you reading a book? Are you sharing it with them? Are, are you sending your people to uh, workshops and seminars? Are you helping them with various materials to help them continue to grow? Because I think the ultimate in leadership is when you can develop other leaders. So when you leave, the team, the organization can stay as strong, if not better, because you did such a great job of teaching the people on how to be leaders themselves. Mm, that is absolutely amazing. For people in the audience, did you catch those seven keys of leadership that Jim just shared with us? Number one was clarifying your vision. Number two was building trust. Number three, creating an edge. Number four, being an effective communicator. Make sure that you have effective channels of communication. Leading by example was number five. Number six, leaving a profit. And number seven, being a servant leader. Uh, and Jim, I totally agree with you, especially with the servant leader um, ideology. It's uh, it, it really gained traction now. And um, I actually interviewed Howard Bihar 
um, on this. Uh, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Howard Bihar. I'm not. So Howard Bihar is the former president of Starbucks International. I mean, he's the guy who grew Starbucks from like 28 stores in North America to 15,000 stores internationally. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So I interviewed him and, and it, that was that into the whole interview was on servant leadership uh, and it was fa fantastic. He's a really big supporter of it. And he, he says that's how he actually led uh, the team at Starbucks while he was with Starbucks in his career. Well, thank you. You know, I want to share one thing because uh, on the servant leadership, I had a chance to attend a leadership seminar not too long ago and I got a chance to meet uh, Ken Blanchard that wrote the one minute manager and many bestsellers. And he just came out with a book called Servant Leadership in Action, where he compiled information from various business and religious leaders and how they implemented servant leadership to be more successful. It's a wonderful read for your audience. Right, right. Okay. So, so it was uh, Ken Blanchard, is that right? Ken Blanchard, correct. Ken Blanchard. And sorry, what was the name of the book? Servant, uh, servant Leadership in Action. Servant Leadership in Action. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what I'll do is I'll see if I can grab a link for that book uh, and I'll drop it in the description of the video so people can just go and, and access uh, access the link and go straight to to the book page so okay. thank you for sharing that Jim that's awesome um, so these seven keys of leadership um, do, do you have any strategies for how somebody can actually develop those uh, and make sure that they they uh, they actually are able to competently work on all seven of them and not just one or two? Well, I, you know, I think it's something that you really have to be cognizant as a leader on uh, being consistent with your actions and what you say. And then I think it's really, it goes down to a few things. One, understanding the first person you must lead. I know we've already talked about is yourself. So yeah. are, are you clear of your core values? Are you clear about your mission? Are you clear about your team or organization mission? And are you living in consistently? Mm -hmm. Then a couple other things are, are you growing each day? Are you teaching your people how to grow and helping them grow? Uh, are, so it's been servant leadership. And the other thing is uh, you, making sure that there's clarity on what is your leadership philosophy and how you can help people develop their own leadership philosophy because everybody has a little bit different take on things. And then, uh, you know, something we talked about, but you really always got to find ways to keep the channels of communication open. Mm. Uh, you know, I know they've said things, uh, and there's a lot of truth to it, you know, my, managing by wandering around, you know, getting out, knowing your people, getting out in, into the crowd. Uh, those are all important. And I think people that aren't aware of what's going on uh, loosely, usually lose their teams or organizations pretty quickly. So you got to make sure that you're keeping a handle on that. And when you're very clear as a leader, what I found is I became more successful leader because now I became more attractive and I had people that uh, wanted to be part of our program that were successful people because we were attracting that because I think I became a much better leader and people wanted to be around me. So success attracts a success. It's a, it does take time. Uh, I wish I had a great formula that could turn you into the best leader in one day. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, you know, I think it's understanding these principles and then put implementing them every single day and being cognizant of, you know, uh, what you're doing. And I'll, I'll say one sidelight, the best leaders uh, are still making mistakes, but what they do very well is they take responsibility and they're, they're not afraid to admit their mistakes when they do, okay? Because people appreciate that. We're all human. Uh, but if you come with this arrogance that I never make a mistake, um, that I think that really breaks down the trust in your organization. Yeah, well, honesty is the best policy, right? Absolutely. <laughs> awesome. And it's just even more important when you are, when you are the leader. So yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Uh, so Jim, you s talk about these seven keys and uh, you said, you know, you, you went down the list, number one, number two, number three, etc. So are, are they 
in that order for a reason. Like, are you supposed to focus on number one? And unless number one is accomplished, you shouldn't really move on to number two. And once you've only accomplished number two, should you move on to number three? Um, or is, is, is there, is there uh, another reason for why they, they have that sequence? Well, you know, when I was developing, and that's a great question, is I, I do think the first one is, was there for a purpose because I think until you understand your, your Claire on what you're all about, you know, as I said, your personal mission, then I think uh, it, you'll struggle with anything else. And then the second one was there on intention as well as trust because I, I really believe that if you don't have trust in your team organization, you're going to falter. Uh, mm -hmm. So those two were intentional. The other ones that I, I can't say that will be in exact order. I think you could mix those up and you still come out, you know, whether you want to say uh, leave a profit, you're, you know, developing your leadership, you could put that three. Um, I didn't, I wasn't as conscious of saying, okay, if I got through building trust, now if I move on to three, creating an edge. Um, but those are things as I'm just formulating my formula of what I found was being successful as a leader. Those are the seven that I put them together in that order. But I can't say that they're in an order that specifically, like if you changed them, it, it wouldn't work. All, although I do think the first thing you got to do is understand and have clarity about yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think you always have to be conscious of are you building trust successfully day in and day out? Because if you lose trust, I think it ruins everything else. Awesome. Um, I'm wondering, Jim, I'm, I'm, I'm putting myself in the shoes of somebody in the audience right now who's sitting there and they're thinking, well, by the sound of all this, it sounds like that you have to be an extrovert in order to be a successful leader. And I'm not an extrovert. I'm an introvert. And I, I'm a little bit shy. I'm a little bit reserved. And I find it difficult to kind of reach out to people and connect with people and, uh, you know, main, maintain like that, that open dialogue. So what advice do you have for those people? Like, do you have to be an extrovert in order to be a great leader or can introverts develop that skill as well? That's a great question. And my research tells me, and it's interesting you said you're an introvert because I would consider myself more an introvert, although I'm on stages a lot. So people think I'm an extrovert. When I was growing up, I really struggled. I was really shy. Uh, I think you can develop these skills and become where you become more comfortable in the public. Uh, and as a leader, I think there's certainly things that you have to be able to be willing to reach out to people and get out of your comfort zone. But uh, my studies have found that a lot of successful leaders by nature are actually introverts mm. because they do a lot more self-analysis. Um, and I guess a tendency is when you're an extrovert, sometimes that you come across as arrogant, uh, and, and certainly, uh, you want to be confident as a leader, but be humble at the same time and not be arrogant. So to answer your question, I really believe leadership is where you can develop skills and whether you're an introvert or an extrovert, I think you can be a successful leader in either one. Fantastic. So that's good news for introverts then. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, here's the thing. I, I think you're absolutely right because introverts do tend to be the people who ha pay a lot of attention to detail. And they're also the people who listen a lot. They tend to be great listeners. So I think those strengths can actually help them become great leaders. Would you agree? I absolutely agree because, you know, you said the one that just jumps out to me when anytime I hear about leadership, uh, it, that other L word, listening, is so powerful. Mm, yeah, yeah. So uh, listening and leadership go hand in hand. I love that. Yeah, beautiful. Um, Jim, a, a lot of the times when people think about, say, great leaders, they think about people like, you know, John F. Kennedy and Martin Luther King, these people who had like, tons of charisma and they could stand and talk to like thousands, uh, hundreds of thousands of people in front of them. Um, and, and, and they could very confidently articulate, you know, and articulately convey their message. And you talk about confidence there, but you also talk about humility. So how, how can people maintain that balance? So how can they work on developing the balance on being confident, but not coming across as, you know, arrogant or cocky, but they, they maintain that humility at the same time. Well, I'm going to say a couple things. One is that 
leader, the most effective leaders are influencing people. Now, with that in mind, like you mentioned a couple, you know, the great leaders in, in history, but how about a leader that influenced a lot of people in a negative way, Adolf Hitler? Okay, so he still influenced a lot of people. He was a dynamic speaker. I mean, people were following him, but obviously in an evil way. So to answer your question, I think is that uh, it's really a, in developing confidence I always told our players, you got to deserve victory. And what I mean by that is, are you willing to put the time and the investment to get better? And, and when you are investing in yourself and getting better and then investing in others and helping them get better, that builds confidence. Now, there's a fine line between confidence and arrogance. And I think as a leader, you have to recognize that you believe in what you're doing but going back to that old L word, are you willing to listen? Mm -hmm. Because I don't care how smart, how confident you are, you do not have all the answers. And if you think you do, then that becomes arrogance and that gets you in trouble. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's amazing advice. Um, Jim, a lot of the times when people talk about leadership, there's that element where you need to be able to connect with people and you need to be able to not just connect with them, but like you said, influence them to work together in a team to work towards a common goal. And we talked about a little bit about how you need to open a, you know, have open communication policy, how you need to be focused on others and, and, you know, follow the servant leadership model and help other people develop and ask them, you know, what, what are you working on and how as a leader can I serve you? And I think that's, that's beautiful. But are, are there any specific sort of strategies or some sort of mindset that people need to work on to develop in order to actually influence others to make sure that they do buy into your idea as a leader, do buy into your vision as a leader, and actually do actually collaborate and work towards a common goal? I think the huge thing on that is, and I'll, I'll use my example in my coaching career, is this preparation. Uh, People that you are part of your team organization are going to be really much more impressed and be willing to follow you if they feel like you're prepared. You know, for example, like every day that we went into practice, we always had a written practice plan. We were organized to the T, minute by minute. I think the same thing when you're running a meeting. Well, you know, you always hear about people saying this is a waste of time. So we always were talking about being prepared and never wasting time. Now, I'm, I'm not going to say that we never did waste time. That's not reality. But I will say that we were really conscious of being prepared, studying our craft, and making, helping our team be as be prepared as they possibly can. And that, that we were very conscious that we, when we were together, whether it was a team meeting, a, a, a social event, a practice, a game, that we were organized and the players appreciated that. So I think preparation is really a key on making sure that now they're – have confidence in you. Like if I walked out uh, for a practice to prepare for a game and I said, well, I don't know anything about the other team. We're just going to shoot some baskets. What do you think my team would The response wouldn't have been very good. But if I come out with this plan, okay, here's, we've looked at them. This is their strengths. This is how we're going to attack them. And this is what we need to do in practice. Wow. That's a whole different ball game. And I think that's where people appreciate is when you're prepared. Hmm. Preparation. Right. So preparation is the key here. That's yep. th yeah. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing you say right now that for a leader it's super important, not just to be prepared for yourself, uh, but also prepare your team to face any situation and any adversity that might come. Absolutely. And I'll add one thing, cause you brought up adversity. I think one of the keys as a leader is you have to build challenges. Uh, you know, for me, it was in practice, it creates adverse situations so that your people or in my case my players were ready to handle adversity because we all know adversity is coming <laughs> and if we're not prepared to handle it then you know sometimes the ship will sink so it's really important that you train your people that adversity will come but how do we respond to it is really important mm, yeah yeah I love that yeah I absolutely love that um, 
Jim, I want to go back to Jason's story. Uh, it, it's, it's so phenomenal. And I know that, that you, talk, you talk about that in your, in your speeches as well. Um, right. it, yeah, and uh, it, it, indeed, it's a very powerful story. But I want to kind of go back. I mean, having talked about everything that we have just talked about, you know, in terms of being a leader and, and the seven keys, and we've, you know, explored other things as well. What in the moment made you kind of ask Jason to go on the field when the game is about to come to an end and you just kind of had that faith, just had that trust as a leader in Jason to say, no, I, this, like Jason can do it and I'm going to put Jason in there. What was it as a leader that, that enabled you to take that, some people might even call that a risk? Mm-hmm. Well, I, you know, I think we could look at it. It, it certainly could have been a risk because uh, I certainly didn't want to see Jason be embarrassed. And I'd seen him play a lot because he came to a lot of our off-season games and that kind of thing. So, but a couple things that jumped out to me. One, I wanted to reward Jason for his loyalty and, and his commitment to our program. And that's a way that I could do that. Two is that uh, I, I had confidence because Jason came to practice every day that even if things didn't go well for him, which early the first two shots he missed, including his first shot was an air ball, is that he would handle the adversity because he had been with us every day and he saw how we handle adversity. We called it next play. And what we mean by that is if you make a mistake on the first play, you got to move on. And we would really focus on developing that mindset that, you know what, you got to learn from your mistakes, but we got to move on next play. Because in sports, like anything, things move quickly. And if you're still uh, wallowing in your sours, sours because you uh, struggled with adversity, then you're not ready. And that was the one thing I felt confident that Jason, even if he uh, started bad, which he did, he would be able to handle it. And he, he uh, I think that really helped the success. And then, of course, building that team – camaraderie where the team wanted to help Jason as well. And that was really neat to see. Awesome. Um, and I'm actually wondering, you know, as a, as a leader, how important is it to have a growth mindset yourself as a leader? And uh, to follow up with that question, how can you, how can you actually develop the growth mindset in your team as well? Well, I, I, first of all, I'll say, I think it's essential that you have a growth mindset, and I certainly do. I always am striving. I mean, I've been out of coaching for a couple of years, but I do a lot of leadership presentations, so I am still studying my craft. I'm still reading a book a week on uh, various success and leadership principles because I, 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 I hope I'm going to continue learning until they, they put me off the earth here. Uh, <laughs> and the second thing is, is that I think it goes back to lead by example that, you know, if you're sharing that you're consistently growing and you're emphasizing to the people you're working with that, uh, you know, I always would say to our players, we're either getting better or we're getting worse. You don't stay the same. Mm -hmm. And I would really focus on them. And I really emphasize with them the growth mindset that we've got to strive to get better, a little bit better each day. And that it's the old law of accumulation. If I get a little better each day, just like investing money in, in a financial plan, you know, it starts slow, but then after a while it starts to accumulate. A great little tagline is life accumulates. And either it's going to accumulate you in a positive way if you keep feeding your mind, keep growing, or if you stay static, it's going to accumulate in a bad way. So. Mm. Yeah, or like uh, taking care of your body. You know what? I mean, you don't gain 20 pounds in one uh, meal. You know, you that's something that, that you're constantly having, a, unfortunately, a bad discipline where you're eating a lot of bad food. Now you're going to start putting weight on, you know, if you don't exercise or take care of yourself. But that doesn't happen usually, uh, you know, in a couple of days. That's a, something that accumulates, just like taking care of yourself. You know, that accumulates the other way. So. Mm, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim, I'm also wondering what, uh, what have you experienced as some of the non 
sexy parts of being a leader, such as holding people accountable or having those difficult conversations with people about the fact that they are just not showing up as the best version of themselves, or they're not working on their weaknesses and they're constantly letting everybody else down in the team. So how, how do you actually do that as a leader? Well, I think there's two things, uh, and there's certainly multiple ways, but two that jump out to me. One is that you have to continue to clarify your mission or vision with the team on a consistent basis. So that you're really always sharing your expectations. And of course, ours was that we're striving to get a little bit better each day. And, you know, what are the goals that we are uh, – that we put together as a team, you know, we would post them, everyone had a copy of them. So we had clarity of where we were trying to drive to. The other thing is, is when you have people that are falling off the bus or the ship, is that as a leader, you've got to uh, take the initiative to reach out to them and talk mm -hmm. to them individually. Because I found in most cases, when you talk to a person one-on-one, -on -one, you can learn a lot. And again, it goes back to that old word, listening. You got to ask questions, find out, you know, what's going on. Why, why are they acting this way? Or, you know, why aren't they interested in getting better? Uh, and you know what? Most of the time that straightens out. There are a few times where unfortunately, uh, you're not on the same page and it looks like it's not going to go. And then you got to share that, you know what, it's best that maybe you go on and find another bus, another team. Uh, that's certainly when we pick our team, we always tell that my, my goal is to have the team start and finish together. Sometimes it does not happen though, because if somebody is really uh, becoming a cancer to your team and they, they're not willing to change that, then it's probably best to eliminate that person. Right. Okay. Yeah. Awesome. I, and I think that's really sound advice. That's really sound advice. Um, very quickly, Jim, the seven keys that you talked about and, and uh, other principles that we have explored as well, can they just be applied to leaders in the convention sense? Like you have to be a coach, you have to be a manager, you have to be a director, you have to be the CEO, et cetera. Or can they be applied to, for people who might not have all those positions? They, they just have the, you know, they just have a normal job and, you know, they might be the leader of their family or, you know, they might be leading a, a play group. For example, a teacher in, in a nursery setting, she might be leading a play, a play group um, mm -hmm. or, you know, just, just your friends. You might be, you might be actually encouraging your friends to, to uh, improve themselves and uh, you know get get improve their lives and get better. I, I think leadership principles can help you in any phase of your life because um, you're going to have some leadership responsibilities. It might not necessarily be in a job. You know, it could be as you said, your family or just leading a group of peers. Uh, you know, like one of the greatest leaders of all time, Mahatma Gandhi, actually had no title. All right. So it wasn't like, but people followed him because of who he was and, and when the vision that he created. So, it, it, you know, I think so you don't have to have a title to be a leader. And as we mentioned before, I know it may be redundant, but the first person you must learn to lead is yourself. And, uh, you know, if you want to have a successful life and success, I think one of the keys to that is what is your definition of success? Uh, because my definition of success and your definition of success may be totally different, and that's fine. But are you living in a way so you're living up to your definition of success? All right, uh, and that—that's what I think the key is. When you, and that, that's why you got to analyze and ask questions like, why were you put on this earth? What is your definition of success? Uh, and you know, uh, do you believe in serving others? Okay, in my opinion, I think that's the essence of life or the ability to serve others. You know, for some other people, they may not be, but that's what you got to figure out is ask some of these questions, analyze, and then put them into practice. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jim, can you tell us a little bit about your book as well? I think the title is A Coach, A Miracle. Right. It's called A Coach and a Miracle. And then we actually originally came out in 2011. Uh, this is the old copy. And uh, I actually, uh, we did a revision uh, that we released last year where we updated it. And uh, what, what is about 
is it talks about the story, but we made it a life lessons book. In fact, it was actually based on my first keynote, which is called Dreams Really Do Come True. And in that keynote, there are some overlapping principles, but I have six keys that I talk about, and that's the first six chapters of the book. Those keys, just very quickly, is what is your passion in life? What is your mission, which is kind of an overlay of what we just talked about. Um, goal setting, how to be an effective goal setter, which is part of creating the edge. Perseverance, how to overcome obstacles, which Jason was a great illustration of that. Number five, I talk about carpe diem, which of course means seize the day. And in that, I talk about work ethic and attitude, things you can control. I always talk to people. One of the things we always talk about are players. If we're going to be successful, we have to be excellent in the things we can control. And I'd always ask them, can we control our work ethic? They'd say, yes. Can we control our attitude? Yes. And the other things that you have to do is realize the things you can't control, you learn from, but you move on. And then the last one I talk about in that keynote is being a team player. And we always talked about the we mindset over the me. Okay, you do have to take care of you. But when you start thinking of a bigger situation where the team becomes the essential piece, then you get something special. Mm, absolutely. I love that. And thank you for sharing that, Jim. That's beautiful. I'll put the link below in the description of the video. Guys, make sure you go and check that out. The book is called A Coach. Uh, sorry. Yeah, a coach and a miracle. So make sure you go and check that out. The link's below in the description. Jim, thank you so much for this. This has been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I, I don't know if you can see this. I'm going to show this. I've got this whole page full of notes. Can you see that? Can you see that, guys? I That's can't. a whole page full of notes, okay? I, I hope you guys have been taking notes. I've got a whole page full of notes. It's just everywhere. <laughs> I loved it. Um, but very quickly, Jim, before we wrap up, where can people go to find out more about you and how can they reach out to you? Yes, uh, so my uh, website is called CoachJimJohnson.com. That way I wouldn't forget it. And I'd be glad to share my personal email. We have a, a group email that goes to my manager uh, on the website. But if you uh, want to personally reach out to me, my email is jjhoops, J-J-H-O-O-P-S, at rochester.rr.com. And Rochester is spelled R-O-C-H-E-S-T. E R dot R R dot com. So JJ Hoops at Rochester dot R R dot com. Coach Jim Johnson dot com. I'm on three social medias. I'm on LinkedIn. So I'd love to connect with the people on that. I am on Facebook and I'm also on Twitter. So at Coach Jim Johnson. So uh, I do a book recommendation every week uh, that I put on those three social medias. And certainly we share videos and other uh, interviews like I'm doing today with you. Uh, you know, and just trying to help people and serve people the best we can. Awesome. Well, thank you much for sharing that. Guys, you have been handed the keys to the kingdom. Jim just shared his own personal email address. What are you waiting for? Seriously, what are you waiting for? Get on the email, send him a message. He's amazing. He's awesome. And I'm super grateful to have him on the show. Jim, thanks so much for your time. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Great to talk to you. And I hope to meet you in person someday. So. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'd love to meet you in person. Uh, and a big shout out to Corey Poirier, by the way. Uh, he's, I don't know if he's watching this, but if you're watching Corey, you're awesome, man. This wouldn't have happened without you. Um, and uh, guys, check out Corey's new book. It's called The uh, Book of Public Speaking. Uh, it's below in the description. The link will be there. Jim has been featured in the book. Corey interviews him, talks about the origin story and talk about Jason's story as well. It's phenomenal. Make sure you check that out. And also Jim shares some amazing insights about how you can become an amazing speaker, how you can actually get paid for your speaking. Some amazing strategies. Make sure you check that out. The link will be below in the description. And with that, guys, as always, thank you so much for spending this time with me. You know what? I really appreciate it. My, my passion is real. I, I come here and serve you guys every single week. That's what I want to do. Um, so, you know, I just really appreciate you spending this time with me. Just make sure you go ahead and hit the subscribe button down below so you can stay up to date with whatever is happening on the channel and you can enter the channel competition where you get a chance to win a free access pass to my new course on networking strategies on how I found and connected and then built relationships with super successful people and got them on my YouTube channel. So you have the chance to win the free access. Also. Guys, the biggest compliment you can pay me and Jim is to pay this forward. 
just pass it on pass it on to somebody who needs to hear these messages pass it on to somebody who can benefit from listening to these ideas to being exposed to these ideas you're the average of the five ideas you spend the most time with and you know what i showed you i've got a whole page full of notes from this mm-hmm. conversation alone right so just pay it forward that's the biggest compliment you can give me and jim right now apart from that stay awesome hustle hard and i will catch you in the next one